talk to you about Canadian history. But this is not the history of battles won or battles lost, nor is it about constitutional changes or crises, nor is it about disasters, whether natural or caused by us humans. This is ephemera, uh, mere symbols. Yet these symbols mark the progress of the country from four sparsely inhabited provinces in the east to a great nation that spans the continent and reaches towards the pole. Now, the symbol that has identified Canada through most of its history, from 1868 through to 1965, has been the Canadian Red Ensign. And those of you who are old enough can perhaps remember it, that that was, that was our Red Ensign. And you'll see him in legions and in other places around the country. First, let's look at exactly what is an ensign, and for that matter, what is a jack. Here you see a painting by William Vandevel the Younger, done in 1672. This shows the flagship of the British fleet, with King Charles II inspecting the fleet, and he is on board. And you see these different flags uh, here. Here is the ensign at the stern, and the ensign is at the stern because in a sailing ship, especially in those days, that's where the command was exercised from. That's where the captain was, the officer of the watch, the helmsman, and because they had to see to be able to see the sails. And that's exactly the same today in, a, in an ordinary sailing yacht. The helmsman sits at the stern. At the bow is the jack. The jack is uh, hoisted on a little mast uh, out on the bowsprit. Up at the ma main mast head is the standard, the standard of King Charles II. Other flags that you see here at the foremast is the Admiralty flag that was also flown on the Britannia. And the Union flag is again flown on the mizzen mast. And I might say these are exactly the same flags that the Queen used to fly on the Britannia. Uh, their design had changed a little, but the same flags until they took it away from her and put it up in Leith as a tourist attraction. The rest of those flags are for decoration. They didn't have signal flags to put between the masts in those days, so they put pennants and the flags up. The way they phrased it, it was for bravery. Bravery meant show off, it didn't mean courage. I like to think that this is the occasion in which King Charles II, standing up to a six, over six foot, standing up to acknowledge the royal toast, hit his head on the beam up above. And at that point, he gave permission for the Navy always to drink his to the toast to the sovereign sitting down, a privilege that we retain to this day. Whereas the Army and the Air Force, they have to stand up. Now, I was told in a recent visit to England that it was William IV and not Charles II, but I don't quite believe that because William IV spent time in the Navy, he was known as Sailor Billy, and he would have known not to hit his head. So I think it's Charles II. This next picture shows an 18th century frigate. And again, you see, here's the ensign at the stern and the jacket in the fore part of the ship. The ship is a, at anchor. Now, changes in rig had now occurred. So while in the 17th century, the jack always remained on the jack staff and the ensign on the ensign staff at the stern, whether at sea, or import, the changes in rigging have caused that to be altered. Because you can see here that the Latin mizzen sail has been replaced by a boom and gaff sail. And if the boom swung across, it would knock off the, the, the ensign staff. And also the square sprit sails that you saw on the, on the uh, Royal Prince on the previous uh, slide have been replaced by jibs, triangular jibs, just the same as on the Blue Nose or on a yacht today. And uh, 
the jib sheet would come across and either knock off or be fouled upon the, the um, jack staff. So it became the rule that ships did not fly the jack at sea. That remains to this day. And the uh, ensign was shifted when at sea up to the gaff, up to the mizzen gaff, or to the gaff at the, uh, uh, the second, whatever is the last mast on the ship. And that custom has continued to this day. Uh, so warships, you will see, will fly their ensign on an ensign staff at the stern and harbour, but uh, at sea they will lower it and it will be hoisted either on a mast that is towards the end of the stern of the ship or in modern warships with only one mast about a third of the way from the bow at least on a spur that sticks out from that mast towards the after end. Merchant ships have more or less conformed to that down the years. Generally there's a place somewhere at the after end of the ship where the ensign is displayed. Here in fact is a uh, picture of a paddle steamer, a very early paddle steamer built in 1842, the Quebec. You can see she's got the ensign at the stern and she is uh, flying a Union Jack at the bow. By the way, the blue flag with 50 stars in it flown at the bow of an American warship when it's in harbor is also called the Union Jack. Union, 50 stars, and it's thrown at the bow. It's a jack. On the 9th of July, 1864, the Admiralty issued an order, an order that was long overdue. Well, up to that time, the majority of British ships at sea flew a red ensign. That's because one third of the Royal Navy ships and squadrons flew a red ensign. Ships operating independently, like explorers such as Captain Cook, uh, Captain Vancouver, uh, they flew the Red Ensign. All merchant ships flew a Red Ensign. Privateers also flew a Red Ensign. Liverpool Packet and those privateers from Liverpool during the two wars, the two wars with the Americans. This had originated back in the middle of the 17th century in the three wars with the Dutch. Huge fleets of a hundred ships or more fought each other among the shoals of the Dutch coast and the Thames estuary for days on end. And nobody could control a hundred ships. So they divided them into squadrons, the red, the white, and the blue. And each squadron had a, an admiral, a vice admiral, and a rear admiral. And that would amount to, you can think of it, 11, 12, 10 to 12 ships per admiral. And that was more controllable. The most common signals in those days were all captains to come aboard the flagship for a conference and all ships to send a lieutenant to the flagship for orders because they didn't have a system of, of giving detailed instructions. In this 18th century, it changed. Instead of the admiral taking his color from the squadron, the squadron took the color from the admiral. So the various grades became divided into three. When a captain was promoted, he became a rear admiral of the blue, and then a bit later, a rear admiral of the white, then a rear admiral of the red, then a vice admiral of the blue, and he went up the ladder like that. But you can see that meant that most of the ships at sea were red ensigns. Uh, now, the, what the Royal Navy did in 1864 was to uh, say, right, from now on, the white sent ensign is for the Navy, the red ensign is for the merchant service, and the blue ensign, some merchant ships whose captains and a certain number of the crew were in the, uh, in the Naval Reserve, would um, could fly a blue ensign, and government departments uh, they would could fly a blue ensign with their insignia in the fly, and uh, a few years later they said right, and now colonial governments who own ships, 
for fisheries protection, whatever, uh, whatever purposes, they can fly a blue ensign with the crest or the badge of the colony in the fly. Here is a picture of uh, the ensign of my old training ship, the Conway. Now here is a picture of the paddle steamer Druid. Now you'll see that she's flying a blue ensign with a, a crest, a badge at, at the stern. This, if this picture represents her before 1867, then uh, that rep would be the badge of Nova Scotia, the crest of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. It's after 1867 from the crest of Canada. In 1868, the College of Heralds in Britain sent over the design of what was to be the Canadian shield, the Canadian crest. Um, and they weren't very imaginative. They just took the shields of the four original provinces and put them together. And uh, this is, uh, you see this, and uh, I actually have held the original paper in my hand, wearing gloves, of course, cotton, white cotton gloves. And what, what you see here is the arms of Ontario and New Brunswick, which are just the same as they are today, but in the what is called the second quadrant is the arms of Quebec, which is a little bit different because, as you see, there's two blue fleur-de-lis on a yellow ground at the top, and now it's three gold fleur-de-lis on a blue ground. And Nova Scotia's has completely changed. What you see there is three thistles and a salmon. The Nova Scotia one was changed to the one we know today, the blue saltire uh, with the Scottish um, lion in the middle. Uh, that was done in 1929, and the Quebec arms changed in 1939. This, in fact, was all Canada was at that time. The provinces uh, and Quebec and Ontario did not stretch up to the north. That part was known as Rupert's Land. It was not until 1880 that Canada took over those northern territories, the British government said, right, you know, Canada, you, you will take over that. You'll own it as well as just administer it. Here is an actual original 1868 ensign. Here is an enlargement of the, uh, the coat of arms. Manitoba Joint Confederation in 1870, British Columbia in 1871, and Prince Edward Island not till 1873. Now, I was always convinced that there was no such thing as a five or six province flag, but a Canadian living in Texas has sent me this little flag, which appears to be made of silk, and therefore dates from 1870, and it shows five provinces, including the Manitoba Buffalo, which is charging. So it looks rather like a cow. There is also a larger version in the Museum of Manitoba. From 1873 to 1905, there were seven provinces. Here is a seven province ensign. Although I called the original ensign 1867 to 1873, the actual flag could be later because officially, as far as Britain was concerned, the College of Heralds was concerned, the four province shield and the four province flag was the flag of Canada, right up to 1922, when a new red ensign was introduced. But Canadians largely ignored it. When new provinces joined, they, they were added to the flag. As far as the British Admiralty was concerned, they really thought that Canadian merchant ships would just continue to use a plain red ensign, and quite a lot of them did. Uh, you can tell this from the paintings that are in the museums there at the Round. I made a, a, a survey of about 125 paintings in various museums or recorded in books, and um, about 30% of them had what was obviously a Canadian ensign, usually the larger ships. Now here is a picture of the bark Harriet Campbell built in Falmouth in 1873, and you can plainly see she is flying a Canadian ensign. 
just what the design is, don't know, it's probably four province. Or it might be seven, no, it's more likely seven province. The earliest of these that I've seen is a painting in this, in the museum in Halifax of the full rig ship Quebec of 1870 flying a Canadian ensign. Now here is a, an original, a, a, a real ensign that was probably flown from a ship. And as you see, it's pretty tattered, a uh, bit torn, and since it's at least 110 years old and probably it could be well over 130, it can be forgiven for that. And it's a seven province flag. They also like to decorate them with a crown on top, a beaver on a log below, uh, and a wreath. Uh, in this case, the wreath, we've seen other wreaths that were laurel leaves and oak leaves. This one seems to have maple leaves and oak leaves. It, well, there wasn't any particular rule about that. The beaver usually is on a log. Now, this is how you can date an old Canadian ensign. First of all, how, how many sections are there? How many quarterings are there in the shield? And you'll find the majority of the time that we have used the red ensign, the longest period from 1873 to 1905, there have been seven provinces. And so that puts it into that block of time. Now, uh, the other thing is the crown. In the latter part of Queen Victoria's reign, and when the present queen is on the throne, the crown has a dip in the middle of the top. This is called the imperial crown. They started to use it for Queen Victoria when she was made uh, Empress of India back in the 1870s. And when the king was on the crown, King Edward VII, George V and George VI, it's rounded at the top like this one. When uh, Prince Charles takes over uh, in the future, you'll find that the crown changes. The third way is the British Columbia symbol. Now, at first, all they had was the regular colonial symbol of a wreath with a lion and a crown and the initials BC. Well, in 1895, a, a new design was invented by a, a Reverend Canon Beanlands, which consisted of a Union flag and uh, the sun setting over a heraldic sea. So that was in 1895, and then people said, oops, you can't have that. That's the sun setting on the British Empire. So they reversed it, and they put the Union on top and the setting sun below, and it's, it's exactly the same as we have today. So you can say that this one is contradictory. On the one hand, the crown says it's after 1901, when... Uh, King Edward VII was on the throne, and on the other says it's before uh, 1895, before the Reverend Beanlands did his thing. So uh, it's hard to say, but it's certainly old. Now here is an interesting flag. This one is plainly not a flag to be flown from a flagpole. It's to be displayed indoors or perhaps hung out the window. And um, uh, I understand that it was put on the market by a department store, presumably Eaton's. And you can see that it's now got nine sections, nine quarterings, as they're called. This one represents Northwest Territories. And you can see it's got wheat sheaves at the bottom to represent the prairies and a polar bear on blue and white checkers at the top that represents the Arctic. Blue and white checkers means water with ice in it. The red triangles with gold circles in it, that's the Yukon, gold in mountains. So you can see that this was done pretty soon after the Yukon gold rush. It's pretty hard to say what the crown is, whether that's meant to be a, uh, a uh, dip in it or, or not. Now Saskatchewan and Alberta became provinces in 1906, and actually it's also in 1906 that the BC crest was made official. Uh, so from 1906 
1921, the shield and the ensign had nine quarterings. Uh, the quarterings uh, is the word for a section of a, of a coat of arms or a flag. doesn't matter how many they are. They can be more than four. They're still called quarterings. I, I, I don't have any large nine province uh, ensigns, but I have this one. You can see it's got nine provinces and a full gamut of wreaths and crowns and beavers and lawns and that sort of thing. Well, this was the flag during World War I, but it had got so complicated that actually the armies in Europe fought under the Union flag. And I would say that if you said, what is the national flag of Canada way back in, say, 1900 or uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery's day, you'd probably be told it was the Union Jack. If you look at the John A. Macdonald's campaign posters, it was the Red Ensign, which was, of course, flown by Canadian merchant ships, that was the uh, defined difference that made Canada as opposed to other uh, parts of the British Empire. These, this flag, this complicated ensign, was obviously much too complicated. In fact, if you count the number of little bits, considering that each of the nine quarterings has two or three parts to it, you'll find that there's, uh, you know, three St. George's crosses, three lions, uh, you know, there's a buffalo, there's a uh, uh, wheat sheaves, there, there's three sets of maple leaves, uh, fleur de leaves, the whole thing is just utterly complicated not to be born. So the College of British, there's still the British College of Heralds doing this. Uh, we have our own College of Heralds now, our own heraldic authority now. It is housed in a, a stone building on the grounds of Rideau Hall. It's part of uh, the Governor General's establishment. And um, we also have Heralds. They are Nice, uh, there are people who are, there's a Saguenay Herald, a St. Lawrence Herald, a Fraser Herald, and an Athabasca Herald. If I'd known there had existed, I might have applied for one of those jobs in the past. Must be a pretty nice job. In 1921, effective in 1922, we have the Canadian Red Ensign. This is the Red Ensign that was uh, brought in then, and it lasted till 1957 without any change. And uh, in 1957, they made a change and the maple leaves, instead of being green, became red. And there's a change to the Irish harp. Besides being a, a lady harp, uh, as it's called, meaning it had a head and a bust, uh, it just became a plainly drawn harp. Uh, these are matters of design. Uh, now, the description of a coat of arms in words is called the blazon and there is a sort of uh, medieval uh, anglicized French uh, the words that describe coats of arms um, and one of the words used is proper. Well proper just means something that is uh, depicted in its natural colors. So maple leaves can be green or they can be red or they can be yellow as they are in, the, in nature so or they're just proper and the difference is just a matter of design and the blazon which is an official statement does not have to be changed of course at this time that was the more the national flag the merchant ships flew, flew it uh, canadian government ships the predecessors of the Coast, Coast Department, Transport, Hydrographic, uh, and so on, flew the Blue Ensign, and here is one. And the Royal Canadian Navy flew the White Ensign, as it had done since it was instituted in 1910. In 1965 came in the, the Maple Leaf flag, which was wonderfully done. I'd like to talk to you a bit about the virtues of the Maple Leaf flag. First of all, it's easily recognizable at a distance. Uh, it can be drawn by a grade one student or kindergarten student. You mightn't get the maple leaf exactly right, but recognizable. And it 
doesn't look like any other flag. The closest one is Peru, and the Peru, Peruvian flag is a different red and only has a little badge in the middle. And another thing is that it introduced a new concept to heraldry called the Canadian Pale. Now, in heraldic language, the middle stripe of three uh, on a flag is called a pale, and uh, it's always officially one third of the, of the width of the flag. But the Canadian Pale is 50% of the width of the flag, which is necessary to make the maple leaf look good. So that's a new concept in heraldry, and it's a marvelous flag, the one we all know and love, and uh, uh, will continue to be our flag, uh, I, I, I know and hope, for some time.